Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show today. We're going to talk about what you can do with grass clippings. Eight uses for your weed-free, chemical-free grass clippings. As well as the history of that famous blue jar from Ball. All that starts right now. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether through those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, or anywhere in between. We are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am your host, Joy Barrett. Beside me is my wife, co-host, gardening partner, best friend. Holly, Bar- Holly Barrett. Uh, behind the behind the uh, WNOV mics here in Milwaukee. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for all things gardening, now containing over 1,000 plus garden videos on short and long format. And the reason why we are here each and every week, there's a number of ways to contact us, but the reasons why we're here is because of great companies like... Nacella Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Nacella is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural, natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because it's not Nasala Kombucha. It's not kombucha. Find out more at nasala.com. And there's a number of ways in which you can contact us during the show and after the show with your garden questions. One way you can do it during the show is through the ivyorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250. Ivy Organic 3-1 Plant Garden naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe and organic. For more information, visit ivorganics.com. Again, you can call in at 444-5250. As well as you can tweet us using the hashtag TWVG anytime. If you've got a problem with a plant or what is this, you can certainly uh, please attach a photograph. makes the identification process on our end a lot easier. As well, you can email us at TWVGradio at gmail.com. Same thing, attach a photograph uh, if you have a identification question or problem so we can better help you with that. Well, we want to welcome those who were at the State Fair last Saturday, where we did our talk at the Grand Champion Building on uh, great, growing great garlic, as well as those who came out to the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, Blue Meld Landscape and Garden Center, this past Thursday on a Holly's Talk on Basics of Canning. We had a very nice turnout, very nice evening. We were outside, and uh, we welcome those who are now tuning into the program on that. We do have one talk this week and again if you're scoring at home it is basics of canning this tuesday at the Ger- germantown public library at 6 p.m and holly will uh take control of that and uh again it's not but i think they're gonna have cookies or something oh is that what they're gonna have i don't know there's some volunteer bakers that bake for the talks at the okay. library and i think we told them to make cookies okay now again we want to clarify you're not doing a here's how we can and i'm going to make something right i talk about the safety portions of canning the the very basics of canning water bath canning pressure canning the difference and then i do kind of a loose demonstration of how you water bath can something so that you can see the the process kind of and then we um, talk about good resources and things like that. And you can go to our website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and see now I think we've got 43, 44 different canning what you grow videos where you actually make the item and talk about the safety and, and how to make the tomatoes or the peaches or whatever we're canning right. uh, that's on the website. And you can go to YouTube under the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener as well and type in canning what you grow to the playlist. So you can see what we've done and kind of get an idea of how you can go about doing it the safe way uh, in your own home and with your family. Well, with that being said, we're still cutting grass. It's still the middle of summer. We're only halfway through the month of August, and many of you are wondering where did the year go. Well, that's just part of how life is. But we're going to have uh, we're going to talk about eight things you should be doing with your seed-free and chemical-free grass clippings that you're probably, and maybe some of you are, but most of you are probably not doing this. Now, first of all, let's disclaimer here, chemical-free and seed-free. Seed-free is when the, you let the plant go and it begins to put a seed pot on. Those seeds can be viable, and if you are uh, using these, um, 
on your garden, these seeds may fall and germinate into the soil and you're going to have weeds in the garden. So that's why we want seed free. Chemical free is whenever you don't use any chemicals, especially the weed and feed stuff that has 2,4-D, which is a chemical that will leach into your soil and kill your vegetation. So let's keep those two. And there's other weed and free feeds and other chemicals that you can uh, add to your lawn that's going to hurt if you're using these in the garden. Right. So as long as it's any chemical free thing. So one thing, this is kind of neat, is you can leave them on the lawn. So if you are concerned about your grass being green and lush and uh, nice, if you leave the grass clippings on the lawn, they're going to break down. Now if your grass is one foot tall, you don't want to leave them on the lawn. This is assuming that you trim your, your you cut your grass, you know, once a week or as needed. And um, with that being said, um, you yeah. want to leave them on the lawn, and then that way, what happens is that, that goes back into into the ground. So, and we're talking about you know, it, 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 like you said, small amounts. Not like you're going to cut it for hay for cattle, okay? Right. That, that type of thing. So what will happen is grass clippings can add back up to 25% of the nutrients that the growth removes from the soil. So it'll, it's, like a, it's like a happy little cycle, like how in, in nature, in the woods or, or whatnot, how the, the soil is so lush because the leaves fall and the trees fall and break down. This is kind of the same concept right in your yard. And, and you can do this. I mean, you, again, we've all cut grass when we shouldn't have cut grass, and we should have cut it six days ago, and it's just mounds of grass clippings. Uh, it's not a terrible thing. Uh, some of people, you know, it's not that particular about it. Uh, secondly, uh, many of this may not apply to many of you, but maybe if you're listening on the replay on the podcast or the in-studio video, uh, animal feed. This is obviously a good supplement, a supplement for your uh, animals, uh, whatever that might be. Not all animals are heavier, uh, like cattle are heavier on, on grasses than maybe ducks or chickens, but... Um, uh, cattle feed, and again, you want chemical free, and the seeds, it's not really a big deal with the animals, but the chemicals, that's what you want to watch out for, not to be feeding animals grass clippings or grasses that have got chemicals on them. So we won't really dive too deeply into the cattle feed option on that, but that is something that uh, can be done with your grass clippings. Another thing is what we do all the time is compost. Right, so you can add them to your compost. The nice thing about it is it adds that that green portion or the uh, nitrogen. nitrogen portion. So if you want to leave them on the lawn, maybe you don't, you don't like that, um, you don't like the way it looks or whatever, then you can put them into compost. Another one is uh, lawn clipping tea. We've heard about compost tea, manure tea, um, other types of teas in which you can brew the, the uh, item and then use that water to water your plants. So the way you make this tea, is you take a bucket, put your grass clippings in there, let it sit preferably in a sunny spot or mostly sunny spot for about three days, and then you strain out the grass clippings and then you can water your plants or whatever. It's um, extract, it, it, extracting the uh, nutrients out of the grass clippings. Now, sometimes this can be quite of a stinky procedure. Uh, as this begins to break down in the water, there is going to be, you know, this is not something you want to do when the family's coming over for, you know, a birthday party uh, in a couple of days type of thing. So that's one one way to do it. Or maybe you want them to not stay too long, so you you're like. We have other my... we have other options on that. If you'd like to email us <laughs> on how to get rid of family check members, my, you don't. You yeah. know, when they're staying too long, check out my grass clipping tea. Oh, yeah. that stinks. Yeah. Let me get out of here. Yeah. Uh, another so, one is mulch. mulch. So this is our our favorite. Oh, this thing. is already our primary use for grass clippings. So what you do is you want to let them dry. So you would take your grass clippings, run them along your driveway, or wherever, so that they have a chance to dry out, and then you can use them as a mulch. And if you're using them on a bed that has no plant life in it, you can just simply pour it on the, on the bed and right. let them dry there. But the reason why we're wanting to dry out if we're going to use them around plants is because they can introduce mold, fungus, uh, diseases that can affect your plant's uh, growth and development. So that's why you're wanting to let them dry out. Whether you just let them blow in the, in the, uh, dry out in the yard while you just blow them out the side of the lawnmower and then rake them up or if you bag them and then dry them that way on the, on the lawn, uh, that's a, another way. And you can also, you know, do just pour it on the grass or on the on the bed like we did right so then this uh raised beds it's a lasagna method we, right the we, lasagna method we talked to melinda myers a couple months ago about 
designing a, or doing a lasagna method in your yard and you can use a lot of greens and browns right away and this is a good method if you're wanting to create a raised bed in the spring with like almost no effort uh, the lasagna method of raised beds is the way to go so if you're thinking about I don't want to till up the garden like we talked about last week uh, you can go ahead no a couple weeks ago we talked about getting your garden started uh, we c you can just look up lasagna method of gardening and Melinda's got a great video and article about that online and it's really simple you can get your materials you can start getting your materials now and that you can store and then the other ones you can get in the spring and then another one is a natural dye so and this is what Native Americans did for eons there's a lot of things you can use for natural dye not yeah. just grass clippings but like uh, beet like use beets for that some people have even used coffee grounds um, I tried dyeing my hair with coffee coffee once. It did darken it. Right. That was interesting. But yeah, so you can do a natural dye. So you can look up how to use grass clippings to make a natural dye. I'm going to assume you probably boil the grass clippings to get that, that green. The extraction of yeah. the, the pigmentation. Yeah. And then, so you could do like Easter eggs. Um, so that would be kind of fun. Or even organic fabric dye. Uh, but keep in mind that there's probably going to be some kind of odor that comes off of these weeds or grasses. Right. Uh, and it makes sense. I mean, if you ever get a grass stain on your, your pants or whatever, you do have to pre-treat that to get it out of your clothes usually. So, And uh, the eighth one here is uh, if, you don't, uh, if you're producing way more grass clippings than you can handle, you can take them. There are recycling facilities like where you can take and they'll compost it like the city has uh, in most areas, and I believe Milwaukee is, is one of those areas. But uh, try to use the other methods first before you just haul your grass clippings off to the recycling center. And one thing you do not want to do you do not want to burn them so there's laws about this where the smoke the thick smoke can be harmful to the health and the environment i'm assuming it's because of the high nitrogen right um, now if you if they're all dry and you burn it that's a that's like totally different we're talking about greens uh, the, the actual green grass that you're trying to burn green wet material does not burn very well it smolders and that's a lot of why they're saying that you should not and can't do that based on the laws and uh, restrictions in your community but try to do the other ones uh, compost it mulch um, you can do the dyes if you want or just leave it in the yard if you have too much it will refertilize your yard and save you money on that and you'll have a nice looking lawn as well well, when we come back, we, well, we hope that has helped uh, you in utilizing the re free re resources that you have on your property in the form of grass clippings. When we come back, we've all seen them. They're called the blue canning jar. Holly and I are going to talk about where they came from, how they came to be, and uh, the reasons why you don't want to can in them today, right after this. Have a gardening question? Email Joey and Holly at twvgradio at gmail.com. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. BobX is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. BobX deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. BobX can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit BobX.com. B O B B. Ex.com. I have a growing family and I try to make healthy meals. And one thing I really love about Woodman's is that they have a huge selection of fresh fruits and vegetables. And the quality is really good too. They even carry locally grown produce. And they keep the prices low. So I can stay within my budget and put a healthy meal on the table. I'm Cameron and this is my Woodman's. Hotchin Mill, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour, and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family-owned company, continual standards that are non-GMO, organic at the highest safety levels, offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed, and more, even kosher and gluten-free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information and recipes, visit HotchinMill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. 
Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, Retail Manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Berry. It's the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX106.5 live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So happy you've taken a little time out of your busy Saturday to join us on the program today. Uh, we have still coming to the city of Milwaukee and surrounding areas fresh picked Georgia peaches from tree-ripe.com and, and what, what, what do they have and where can we find them and they have other things besides peaches. Right, so if you like the fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should check out Tree Ripe, Cip tree Ripe Citrus Company. You can find them at tree-ripe.com. They have the peaches, the sweet juicy blueberries, and the fresh shelled pecans. If you're sick of disgusting nasty peaches from your grocer and lackluster blueberries you can get them from tree ripe they stop off at a neighborhood fresh off the truck right from the source you can find more at tree-ripe.com or they go to local farmers market so you don't have to buy a larger portion you can buy a smaller portion as well they have locations all over in clean iowa upper and lower michigan minnesota illinois and right here in wisconsin tree-ripe.com is your go-to for the freshest produce around there you go. And the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. You can find all of our links to all of the sponsors that make this show possible under the radio tab as well as the highlight tab on the right-hand side of the main page. And that website now contains 1,000-plus garden videos and uh, continue to put more out each and every week. Well, one thing that many of us, uh, whether we were gardeners or grew up in a gardening community or, or family, uh, we've all seen the famous blue canning jar. And it's not like true blue. It's more of an aqua blue. But we're very familiar with this. We see this at yard sales on people's mantles, uh, shelves. We're going to talk about where it came from, how it came to be. Now, let's start with the start here. Ball Canning Co Corporation started in 1858. And they made canning jars, and they still make canning jars today. I think they start with brown ones, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there's brown ones, and then there's, like, purple ones, and then there's, green, like green mm -hmm. uh, which are, are more rare. I mean, if you get a brown or a purple one, those are worth probably some money. The, the, the blue ones that we're talking about that most of us are familiar with are very common, uh, and people say, well, how much is it worth? It's really how much you can get somebody to pay for it because they're so plentiful that there's not really a value in it. It's more of a uh, an heirloom or a sentimental or a, a passed down to family. Uh, we've got, I've got. You know who's making money? Mm -hmm. These, this craft store. They're selling one jar for like two fifty. Uh, the blue so canning jars. No, no, just regular canning. Oh, jars. regular canning jars. Yeah. So there you go. If you want to sell, if you want to sell one canning jar, maybe you might make yeah. some money. Uh, <laughs> but but these have been passed down for many generations. I have some on a, a shelf at home. Uh, they're half gal half gallon blue canning jars from my great grandfather, which primarily was probably heavily used between 1930 and 1960 was really the the prime time that those would have been used. So what we're going to talk about here, where how did they come to be and, and all of that, Holly? Okay, so the ball blue jars were manufactured from about 19 1890 to 1920. And they are kind of the distinctive known color of the canning jars or the old canning jars. So the reason they came to be was there was this um, there was this landmark called the Hoosier Slide, which was a large sand dune. It was uh, from kind of kind of bordering this creek that was going into Lake Michigan. So it was a a sand dune on Lake Michigan in Indiana, and it was popular. People would go take pictures with it, or you know, if they had wedding photos, they'd go take wedding photos there. So what happened was that they, while they were developing Michigan City, Indiana, they started to take this Hoosier slide down, and they the people would use that for glass making. Um, and then over the period of 30 years, from 1890 to 1920, 13 and a half million tons of sand were shipped from the Hoosier slide until the great this dune was leveled, and they were shipped to the glass making companies. 
and because of that sand that was in this dune, uh, because of the, the chemical components of it, that's why the glass was a blue color, not a clear glass as we're familiar with today in, in normal everyday items. Right. So they feel that it was because of the chemical analysis, it was a, a lower percentage of high iron, a higher percentage of aluminum, and less magnesium. So because of the science of the sand, who knows how this dune was at the time? I mean, if this was the early or the late 1800s, who knows how long that was there for before they started building the city. And um, so it was that particular sand that made them blue. Now, if you see these old canning jars and, and these blue ones, there are numbers on the bottom. And what does that n th these numbers represent? Uh, in th is there some some kind of science behind that, or what does the numbers mean? It's just the sci the numbers are whoever made the the jars that day. So you were you stamped your jar. You were jar maker fifteen. So you were you stamped your jar with jar fifteen. And at the end of that shift, they paid you for however many jars I'm you made. I'm assuming it was something like that. It, yeah. it w it, in the early days, these were hand blown jars. Right. And that's why you see if you get some really old ones. Uh, you can see that the, 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 the it's not symmetrical. It's not smooth. It's no, there's they some are bumps and gouges and yeah, bubbles. Yeah, we in. have one that's almost like um, a funnel shape. Um, it's not. It doesn't have the clear shoulders. It kind of funnels up more like a like a milk bottle type. I don't know how to describe it, but yeah. So there's different ones. There's definitely. And then at a certain point in the late 1890s, early 1900s, then they went to mold making where they actually infused the glass into a mold and then it was they were more symmetrical uh, all the way through the the production um, with that now you can identify and there's many charts online to how old is your blue canning jar and or how old is your canning jar at all uh, ball is primarily the number one source of canning jars which they uh, are will have been from day one the font size and um, angle of the word ball on the canning jar identifies what decade or what time frame it was made. E each block of time from 1896 to you know, 1858 all the way to the 1970s, they have changed the font during after a certain period of time. So if, uh, whether it has a line underneath it, whether it's more at an angle or straight across, that helps you kind of identify this is from 1913 and 1923 type of identification. Right. So Ball was the original jar makers, and then Kerr came along, and then also Atlas. So Kerr is... And then there was like Drury, D-R-E-Y. Right, that was later. That was later. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so those were the original. And then Kerr came up with the wide mouth jar. So they... I'm assuming that I couldn't find any information on this. I'm going to assume it was some sort of marketing thing where they're like, hey, we're going to do this because Ball, you know, Ball has the game here. We're going to come up with these wide mouth jars. I'm going to assume that's what happened. That's a loose assumption based on my little knowledge of marketing that I have. And, and there's a, like, there's kind of a, a rumor or a myth going across the Internet, and this has been for several years now. On the bottom of your blue canning jar, if you have a number 13, the, the theory or the thought or the myth is, oh, that's a rare jar. And the reason why is, m back in the day, moonshiners would use canning jars to haul their liquor illegally uh, across wherever they needed to sell it. And the the thought, the, the rumor was that the moonshiners would, when they grabbed their jars, if they saw 13, they would break it right away because it was supposed to be unlucky. And that's simply not the case. No, it's not true. It's just like an old wives' tale, an old old canning jar wives' tale. Yeah. There's wives' tales and everything, and that is one of them. So they are not rare at all. Uh, the stories you hear is not true. Um, you're prob more, what's more rare is probably finding an old purple or brown jar or even green jar versus finding a 13, a blue jar with a 13 on the bottom. And there are, you know, I've seen as high as 15. I've really not seen anything like 19 or, you know, higher than 15 on the bottom of jars. Now, maybe you've got some, and there's some people looking at their blue jars right now to see what numbers they have. Uh, primarily, we have in our collection ones through Twelve, one through ten, something like that, is a lot of uh, the repetitive numbers in that realm. Now, people, and these had the old zinc lids, right? They had the um, the zinc lids with like kind of like a wax on the on a top, and some of them had a gasket uh, later on. Mm -hmm. uh, one, you don't want to use that; you want to use the two-piece lid nowadays. And secondly, uh, why should we not be canning in our old 
blue jars. Well, first of all, now that you know the history, you know that the, they were lastly made at the most recent was in 1920. That was almost 100 years ago. And while canning jars are made to stand up to hot temperatures and to be used over time, they were the technology to make jars now is a lot better. So if you think about it, there could be tiny cracks in there. They may not seal right. I mean, you can certainly try. You can certainly use them. But if you have these cool, neat, old blue jars, why would you take the chance of breaking them in your canner? There's a lot of hairline fractures whenever you look at them, and uh, it's not safe. And, and there are a lot of pints and quarts, but there is a lot of half-gallon jars, too, and, and we can't safely can in half-gallon jars anyway, regardless if we buy new from the hardware store or have these passed down through generations. Right. And the reason why, well, the reason let's, why let's, let's go over the half-gallon. The only things talking. that you can can in a half-gallon jar safely are apple juice and grape juice. And it's simply because a half-gallon jar is too large for anything else to be canned safely to get the heat inside of it to make sure that it's removing what needs to be removed, all the bad stuff, and getting a proper seal. Now, and understand that our grandparents or great-grandparents or parents canned in half-gallon jars their entire life, and they lived to be 193 years old, and they were <laughs> fine to the day they died. But because of science and technology, we understand that's not the safe thing now for 2017 to be processing anything except for apple juice and grape juice in these half gallon jars plus you have to have a container deep enough to get two inches of water above the lid of them and most canners or all canners that i'm aware of unless you have a giant sock pot won't allow for that depth to uh, get the jar deep enough and you don't want to put the jar on its side no uh, in any form or fashion no matter what type of jar you're using in the canning procedure so the history of the blue canning jar now you know a little bit more and uh if you do have jars in your family, maybe you can find out a little bit about who used them and when they were used and a little bit of uh, information about that to kind of carry on uh, in your life that you can pass them on to other uh, family members. Well, one thing you can uh, also pass on to other family members is a good piece of equipment because they're going to last your lifetime and probably a little bit longer uh, with your lawn cutting and snow removal equipment from Aaron's. Do you hear that? That's your neighbor shaking in their grass-stained shoes because Aaron's is about to help you step up your grass-cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy-duty steel construction, smarter, smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is the sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. Visit Aaron's.com to find your local dealer for lawn and snow removal equipment. When we come back, Will Allen from Growing Powers from right here in Milwaukee should be with us right after this. Never miss a thing. Sign up for the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener newsletter. Go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and click on the newsletter box. you say you say nasala kombucha it'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step nasala kombucha <laughs> yeah nasala kombucha makes your body happy nasala kombucha makes your body smile the number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at GreenstockGarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water-saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. GreenstockGarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. Proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit GreenstockGarden.com. Beans and Barley Market and Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area where you can find all you need from fresh produce to 
bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available. Open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414-278-7878, and online at beansandbarley.com. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Julie and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. So happy you've joined us today. When it comes to uh, finding what you need for your yard and lawn and all garden and all of that, Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center has that available. We were there this thurs this past Thursday for Holly's Basics of Canning class, and uh, they informed us that uh, I believe yesterday they got in a bunch of or should have, and maybe it's maybe coming Monday, a bunch of their fall items. And what was some of that stuff that they're getting in for? So all they're going to have the mums. Mums are a big deal in the fall. Asters. I'm not 100% sure what those are, but apparently that's a good fall plant. And then the kale, so some fall kale. As well as bulbs. And bulbs, yep. So they'll have that now, and then in a few weeks they'll have some pumpkins and gourds. And, and also their fall appreci- customer appreciation will be coming up, and we'll get you more information on that. So Blue Mills, if you're not familiar, they're in Greenfield at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. They can supply and surpass all of your gardening needs and you can go to bluemels.com or call 414-282-4220 just south of Leighton on Greenfield Avenue. Yeah, we were there uh, on Thursday and Rachel was very accommodating. She's one of the uh, workers there. I knew her stuff and was very excited to have us and host us and was very good with that. So uh, if uh, while we wait for Will to call in, let's go over here some 10 reasons why you... Um, might want to or you should cook in your cast iron pans many of us grew up using cast iron and uh, the reasons why we chose our parents chose to do that is some of these that are in this list but cast iron is a durable material that um, will last for the test of time if you take care of it right and there's there's ways of, of maintaining so this. cast iron pans are a lot of times safer than most modern cookware. Um, they say that they date back to um, over 2,000 years, um, and they've been seen found in China as early as the third century BC. So um, they're they're very old method of cooking, which is good. And one thing is is that they are definitely tough and durable. Obviously, if they're finding things from that long ago, uh, the nonstick pans cannot be used on high heat. Uh, and they can get scratched very easily. Cast iron is not like that. Cast iron is the the go-to uh, item here, and there's many different cast iron companies available um, that you can cook with. And they're they're durable, they're tough, and they come in many different shapes, sizes, from very small to very very large. Right. Okay. So um, a lot of times, because th- they are more non, they are very non-stick or. More nonstick. There is a seasoning process or a curing process you have to do with this in order to get it locked in. Right. So if you if you do like, um, they're not going to be the same as like a Teflon coated pan. With that being said, they're going to be healthier. Right. Because that Teflon (laughs) is not going to flake off into your food. But you do use less oil. So if you compare it to like your, um, uh, I guess like a stainless steel pan, you're going to use less oil versus um, the you know the stainless steel with a cast iron but not as non-stick as Teflon, but it's a good happy median, and it's it's better for you in that sense. Well, what happens is, as you're cooking, a lot of the oils that you use, or the butters, or whatever it is, will infuse itself into the actual pan and kind of uh, lubricate the internal portions of that pan up to make it more non-stick as you use it more and more. Uh, kind of like what you would... Uh, in the automotive world, you use oil in your car, and that kind of infuses into the engine block, and, and it helps it lubricate more. That's the same thing with the pan. It's absorbing that oil and uh, releasing it as it heats up as you continue to use it for many, many years. Right. So when they're seasoned, they, they do mimic the nonstick pans. If you don't want to take the time to season them, they now sell pre-seasoned pans so that you can not deal with that um, that seasoning process and you can get used to cooking with them faster. Yes, uh, and, they, and and again, if you're very trying to be health conscious, 
you might want, and, and you don't want to worry about the Teflon flaking off, the nonstick, or you know they've got this another, this new thing, the copper pan or whatever that thing is. Uh, the cast iron is a, a tried and true item that uh, we've used for many years. And then I grew up on cast iron, as well as the what is that thing called, the Dutch oven, uh, are are predominantly cast iron right. uh, that you can roast your whatever it in in the oven or on the campfire. So you can cook on high heat. You can cook very versatilely with this. So they are really great if you like one pan cooking because they can go from the stove to the hot oven, back to the stove or whatever. There's no handles that's going to get melted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, that is that is exactly what it is. So that's something to keep in mind. You do have a lot of versatility there. And with, with that high heat, you don't have to worry about things getting mushy. Sometimes if you don't have something getting hot fast enough or staying hot, certain things can get mushy or say like you're um you know you see a lot of these videos with the cast iron where you can make skillet cookies or cornbread they're ideal for that now this doesn't mean you can throw your pork chops in the pan walk away for 30 minutes and come back and everything's going to be wonderful you've got to make it's not a walk away do you've got to flip the meat and you're cook or you stir it or whatever it's just not a fix all end all it works great type of thing there's some maintenance in which you have to use for you know, you have to maintaining this, you have to watch it. Right. So the nice thing about it is they keep food from burning. And as Joey mentioned, you can't just leave it there and walk away. But because of the, ther the thermal conductivity of that, how they're so thick, once they get warm, they stay warm, but they're not going to get too hot. And it, I'm sure it is kind of a learning process. Joey definitely cooks in the cast iron more than I do. Um, but it's something that you you have to keep in mind is that they will stay hot all over unlike some of these pans where it might be hot in the center not as hot on the sides it's got that thickness which keeps it hot for a longer time it distributes the heat almost perfectly even and again you not even just oven to stove you can go from grill top to stove to oven and wherever you need to go in that other things that um you know let's talk about the, uh, we talked a little bit about the sizes we've got what is it a, a four t uh, 12 inch we've got a 12 inch yeah i think it's a 12 inch. A and i've seen them as big as 24 inch but also now there is some money that is endured in the m buying f brand new cast iron right so you want to it's definitely an investment but, but if you buy if you buy something like a high quality copper cookware that's an investment too so you have to think about that. You know, what is the comparative here? Well, also, you can get these at, like, thrift stores, yard sales. And if they look like they should have went to the recycling facility, you can bring these things back with a little elbow grease and some maintenance that you can find online to where it is clean, sanitized, and you can use it. And it looks just about brand new in your, uh, in your kitchen. Uh, so you can get them for dirt cheap uh, and then re bring them back. Uh, right, you to, can to get them. you can um, kind of refurbish them essentially because they are they are iron. If they're not taken care of or used, they can rust. And but there are ways to remove that rust so that they are safe for cooking again. There are some drawbacks to using cast iron, uh, and the drawback is cast iron pans have uh, all the benefits that that we've talked about, that, but they uh, are heavy. Mm -hmm. It's a metal pan. It's not some. Uh, stainless steel manufactured human thing in a warehouse in a, a factory somewhere this is actually cast iron metal uh there is weight to it and the goes without saying the larger the pan the heavier it is so if you have difficulty lifting the pan empty just keep in mind that there's going to be liquid and food and everything if you're going to transport it from table to stove to oven the nice thing about that though is that they put handles on either side so uh, even though we have a skillet there is a small handle on the opposite side of the long handle so that if you need to you can use you know both hands and uh, you want to clean the pan thoroughly after cooking which this should be you know standard protocol with anything that we do but uh, water is the number one enemy of cast iron and I and Holly have both cleaned our cast iron skillet with soapy water uh, we've done it uh, and we've let it soak well in water which is not really recommended here it doesn't necessarily damage it if, especially now these new pre-season pans it's not going to damage it if you have a very old one that's what's going to cause the problems it's going to seep into that it's going to absorb that water's going to absorb into the cast iron 
and and start breaking it down but internally. the new pre-season ones are i guess different let's talk so. about reseasoning the pan after you use it and i think this is kind of this will work also for if you just buy one that's not seasoned uh, from the store or you get it from the th uh, thrift store or wherever and you're bringing it back to life right so um what you want to do is you want to place it on high heat once it's warmed up you want to dip a uh, paper towel in coconut oil rub the hot pan with it when it starts to smoke put more oil around it and then turn it off and that's basically how you season it it, you're, you're locking in that oils into the pan, that coconut oil. Now, it, w we recommend, it recommends coconut oil. Now, I don't know why you couldn't use grapeseed oil or vegetable oil. That's because coconut oil is a, a high heat oil. Okay, so it can, and can deal and it doesn't basically essentially burn. Right. Okay. Um, and, and we use, we want to use these frequently. Obviously, you just don't want to use it once and not use it for three years. The purpose of having a cast iron is the versatility and the um, universal use of it. We use ours almost weekly. And if we had more cast iron, we have one cast iron skillet, um, we would use it more. We would use more of them. Right. So one thing I want to say here, and okay. for most people like me who grew up with uh, Teflon, as always, was do not use your metal kitchen tools on that teflon and that was like drilled into my head because the teflon is a coating right. that can be dug <laughs> can out be scraped off and inf right. infused in the food and right. then you're eating teflon so the bonus of this is that you don't have to worry about that you can use all the metal utensils you want while you're cooking and then you'll, you'll be fine uh, you're going to scrape it and tear it up and you're, you're going to scrape you're going to essentially destroy your metal utensils before you destroy the pan right. with with your <laughs> yeah um and then one thing I also wanted to mention is that um, you can s you can stack them. So if you need to store them and stack them, there's no harm in that either. So when it comes to cast iron skillets, if you've never if you've never ever cooked in a cast iron skillet and you're all about this Teflon and easy and and healthy, the cast iron is really more healthier than anything on the market. There is some work that goes into it, and really, uh, folks, if you're going to do anything in life and you want it to do it right, there is work that has to go into it. Very rarely in life does anything just get handed to you on a silver platter and everything is uh, wonderful and, and works great, and you don't have to do anything. And so, uh, there's some work that has to go into it. So when it comes to cast iron skillets, um, we use it, and we are looking at investing into more cast iron because we see the durability compared to some of the other pans that we have uh, in, in our arsenal of cooking uh, uh, supply. When we come back, we're going to answer your garden questions with our garden answers right after this. Have a gardening question? You can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from PlantSuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. PlantSuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit PlantSuccess.com. The River West Co-op Rosary and Cafe is proud to support the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and a lot of other Wisconsin growers as well. The Co-op offers a wide range of local and organic produce in their store and on their cafe menu. From apples to yogurt and everything in between. Open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekdays, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekends at the corner of Clark and Frackney in Milwaukee's River West neighborhood. See what is in store and check out the Co-op Cafe delicious vegetarian menu at riverwestcoop.org garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune just 99 cents at migardener.com with over 300 varieties of non-gmo heirloom and organic flower vegetable and herb seeds available year-round pay less and get more seeds shipping as low as two dollars and fifty cents that just makes sense 
Go to MIGardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools and special blend fertilizer. MIGardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. Uh, for people who are scoring at home or by themselves, we are the only garden radio show in Milwaukee, produced in Milwaukee. Yeah. We're the only one. We're number one. Yeah. With your hosts, Joe and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Well, that's, it, there's nothing wrong with no. that statement. No, it just makes me laugh. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for all things gardening. 1,000 plus garden videos, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and all of that. Uh, we haven't had a good ra- a string here of guests, uh, big name guests, not calling in. No. And then when we email, we do follow up and email their uh, assistants and tell them that they didn't call in. Especially you think, you know, Milwaukee's own Will Allen. Yeah. Oh, well, what are you going to do? And, so and they're not happy that we follow up and we're displeased that they didn't call in when they told us they were going to. So we don't take this lightly. This is so a big we do deal our, to us. we do our homework. We do our due dil- diligence, I guess. Um, and spend, that's a, all lo- we, and spend that's a lot all of time with questions that we come up for these guests. And that's all we can do, show, right? Yeah. But, so you, but you got to learn about cast iron uh, as, a, as a, a second, uh, a third topic today. Right. So, uh, y- If you want to call in with a question uh, on the IVOrganics.com hotline, you can certainly do that. And how do we do that, Holly? And what is IV Organics? IV Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Natural protects plants against damaging sunburn insects and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe and organic. You can find them more IVOrganics.com. If you a gardening question or comment, you can call in at 414-444-5250, or if you just want to tell us how your garden is going, you can give us a call too. Yes. Uh, we got a lot of questions that came in this week on the uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, email, all of that. Uh, the, the, one of the questions was, what variety of white cucumbers do we grow? And, and they are from migardener.com. Uh, that uh, they they have over 350 varieties. A lot of them are sold out, but the the, the cucumbers that we grew are growing are white wonders. Now it's a very interesting item. It's a white cucumber. That's that's what it is. It's very odd looking in the garden to see this white cucumber growing when you're typically thinking a cucumber should be green. Right. So. Um, well, one it's not white, but it's a potato cucumber. It was kind of a brownish color. Uh, this is a like different variety. Right, but it looks like a potato, and that was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, my sister, niece, and nephew, and I ate that this past week when we were out. Now, the, and, the, there's um, no... It, is there really a... I think it tasted a little bit different. Okay. Um, and it, it was denser. It was, I think it had maybe less water content because it was a little bit more denser than a regular cucumber. So that was the potato cucumber. In addition, the white cucumber, I was told by your sister, kind of has that same density little drier inside right but you don't want to pickle the white cucumbers because uh luke from mi gardener said that they trialed some of that last year and they look like uh pickled elephant, elephant toes. toes yeah mm, so great yeah great to eat don't <laughs> pickle those uh, just pickle the pickling cucumbers yeah uh so so when topping your onions when should you do it and how much can you take off top of the greens so we, we did this a couple of weeks ago. You want it, uh, your, the way you know when an onion is ready to harvest is when the green portion falls over and pinches the stem above the bulb. This has happened to us. We're going to harvest onions today. You can see that on Tuesday night's uh, weekly video at 7 o'clock on the website. Uh, you would want to do this about early to mid July, early July as these things are developing. And you want to remove about 50% of the top growth, uh, the top portion of that greens, the greens, the, the chives, I guess is what you call it. The reason why you're doing this is one, it's just like removing the garlic scape on a garlic, uh, hard neck garlic. You're removing top energy and putting energy in bulb development instead of top growth. And you can also use those greens or those chives uh, for cooking. And you're also, in also lessening 
the weight on top of the onion to give you a longer time before that top falls over and pinches the stem and the growth of the onion is done. So I would, we should have done this uh, early July. We waited until about three weeks ago, uh, which would have been late July. Uh, and it could have got these onions a little bit bigger, which if you watch the video on Saturday, these are going to be phenomenal onions, biggest onions we have ever, ever grown, which we had the perfect environment for it this year. A lot of rain, cool temperatures. That's what onions like. So uh, this question is, today is August 13th. Well, this is when they sent it. Now we're on the 19th. But um, so about a week ago, I'm going over my list of what I can plant now. I'm, um, I live in the same area. I, can I plant lettuce, spinach, radish, beets, turnips, kohlrabi, and peas? And then they said, they gave us a compliment that we motivate them with our videos. So yes, they can, they can plant all these things. Uh, based on, you know, if, you have, if we're going to have a long, warmer fall, uh, the peas uh, should be fine. The rutabagas should be fine. Both of those take about 90 days to reach maturity. The uh, uh, kohlrabi takes, what is it, about 60 days to reach, the, the green kohlrabi takes 60, the red kohlrabi takes 65 days to reach maturity. And um, lettuce, spinach, that'll be fine. Beets should be fine. Turnips and beets take about the same amount of time, about 65 days. So you're good to go on that. Go ahead and put them in the ground right now and uh, without any problem. Uh, hopefully we have a longer fall like we had last year, but also we had a short spring this year. Uh, radishes, uh, my radishes survived the heat wave in the past. Uh, harvest uh, in the past harvest time they all do not look very good I don't see any um, what should we do like they don't see the radish shoulders essentially at the top of the soil they just so see the green plant so I would just pull them if at this point if you are not sure um, pull them because they're gonna I mean if they replant this far, replant now's the time to replant right, so your pull radishes. them out and replant them uh, because the heat will s mess these things up to where they won't put any bulb on at all and they'll just shoot a stalk straight up and put seed pods on so you can plant your radishes which take uh, based on your variety 18 to 32 days to uh, get to that stage of harvest time uh, let's see here number five on our I'm in zone 6B. The squash bugs have decimated my zucchini, butternut, cucumbers, and melons. I visited a local place yesterday where squash, squash was just coming in with no squash bugs. Would I be better off planting at a later date? I think in that zone you probably could. We can still get away. Right. Uh, zucchini takes 75 days to reach maturity. And if you don't want to plant zucchini, talk to anybody that gardens. They're going to have plenty of zucchini that they most likely will offer you for free. Uh, the butternut squash takes about 110 days. No way you're going to plant that. You might be able to get away with planting the zucchini right now in Milwaukee and still get a fall harvest at 75 days. It's going to be pushing it. As when we talk about zones, the country is divided into growing zones, which dictates how cold their winters actually get and based on the hardiness of the plant in which you can grow that will stay alive all year round. We're in zone 5, 5A, 5B, based on in the Milwaukee area. Zone 6 would be the central Illinois area type of realm. Mm. Uh, and, and across the country, there's, you know, in, su in southern Montana, there's like five different growing zones in a very small range because there's of the mountains. Well, there's parts like that in Pennsylvania, yeah. too. Because of the mountains. But, right. yeah, so if, you, if, if we think you're going to get 75 days of decent weather, go ahead and put some zucchini in the ground right now. So this is a good question. Um, maybe not here yet, but they wanted to know. Well, maybe it depends on how when your how your pumpkins are doing. Um, I have a pumpkin. I think it's a jack o' lantern variety. It started as yellow and now is orange on the top. What do you think? Can I harvest it? And yeah, you can harvest it. Is if you what you want to do is you want to kind of take a look at the bottom. If the bottom is not quite orange, kind of yellow, you can certainly harvest it. But be careful that you don't break it off the vine. And just make sure it's more orange throughout than any other color. They will ripen a little bit after you remove them off the vine, but you want to leave them on the vine as long as possible. And this is with any orange pumpkin. Now, last year we grew a what is called a Jardel pumpkin, which is a blue pumpkin. And it was dense. It was the best pumpkin that we've ever grown and ever found for pumpkin pie. The smoothest texture of a pumpkin pie consistency we've ever had. You can eat jack ladder pumpkins. It's but but they're, they're kind of stringy, stringy, and they're so bland. Jack o' lantern pumpkins are made exactly for jack o' lanterns. They were bred. They're bred for that, not made. Yeah. bred yeah. <laughs> for that so that you can, they they are stringy so that you can get a lot of the 
they're not meaty essentially is what it is so that they are good for carving they don't have thick walls they have thin walls so that you can carve them get all that stringy uh seedy stuff out of it so that you can make them into a jack-o'-lantern uh, let's go over number nine uh, we we broadcast here in milwaukee and you guys are listening to us whether on the radio station or the tune app simple radio app as well as through our website and then we do in-studio video of uh, replay uh, in studio video of three different camera angles you can find it on the website as well as we do podcast replay so we reach a very broad audience and now we've got a comment coming from Canada in regards to last week's topic about using cardboard in your garden and this was really cool this came in last night about seven o'clock uh, from from Canada yeah from Ontario Canada love your show regarding your last show talking about cardboard in the garden I was planning to use it in the walkways between the veggie beds in place of the fastest here landscape fabric but I will not no, not do it now. For non-edibles like flower bed, it is probably okay, unless you have ducks like myself that like to forage everywhere looking for grubs. I did research and found that according to the Health Canada Gov website, cardboard does indeed in, contain formaldehyde. Now, on that note, uh, and we appreciate that comment, my brother works uh, for the dairy industry, and he indicated that cardboard that's used for food would not have that formaldehyde. But sometimes if you're just getting cardboard boxes off out of a dumpster, it may not identify whether or not it was a food grade cardboard or not. And we had a caller last week call in and, in and informed us of this in which we did not know that information. We appreciate listeners calling in and telling us information that we didn't know. Definitely. We, we learned from you if guys. We, uh, you know, if we say something, you're like, that's not quite right. That seems off. Let C us know. Call us out. Yeah, <laughs> we definitely, we want to learn too. So we like you learning from us, but we also learn from you. But also a very uh, positive question coming from or uh, Ontario, Canada. So that was interesting that uh, they listen up there to the show, not only just here in Milwaukee. Uh, do we have time for one more, Holly? Yeah, real quick. Um, I have looked everywhere. I can't find about overwintering rutabagas and turnips in the ground in Wisconsin. I'd like to save the seeds. Does anybody know? Yes. Uh, we had some rutabagas planted last year that uh, we didn't harvest all of them, and we mounted leaves on top, about a foot and a half of leaves on top of that particular bed. And then this spring, we removed the leaves, and the rutabagas came back, and they went to seed. And we do have a video on the website of us showing how to save rutabaga seeds. Uh, and turnips will do the same thing on that. Uh, so you can save seeds. They will overwinter. But we did have uh, some help with some leaves. Uh, with that being said, this show is possible by all the great sponsors that you hear throughout the program and under, under the radio tab on our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, just like... Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural local herbs. You can find it at your local grocer in the refrigerator aisle. If it's not from Nas if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Ask for your local grocer. Find out more at nasala.com. Well, let's talk about programming note for next week. We're going to talk about how to deal with weeds, whether you're worried about them right now or you're wanting to get a jump start on them next spring. Uh, we're going to talk about all the different options organically in which you can use to get rid of your weeds, control your weeds, maintain the weeds that you have in your garden, as well as why, uh, ways you can preserve your harvest, whether you're buying it from the farmer's market, the grocery store, or out of your garden that doesn't involve canning because maybe some of us don't want to can or we find that it's not necessary uh, but we we're going to go over many ways in which we can preserve our harvest that way as well as Rhonda Fleming Hayes uh, will be with us she's a uh, columnist for the Northern Garden contributor to the Sun Times uh, pap newspaper in Minneapolis as well as an author and even if we have to drag her into the studio, she <laughs> will be with us. Or we're going to break our string of guests not calling in or showing up. Uh, we apologize for that. Like Holly said, we put a lot of time and effort into uh, getting the best guests that we can. And that's in the garden world across the country. And sometimes things don't work out, whether on their end, uh, for a variety of different reasons. But uh, we apologize for that because I know many of you wanted to hear about Ron Finley and uh, Will Allen these last two weeks. Uh, miss any portion of this show or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can find that under the radio tab on the website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, uh, in full link in studio video as well as full link podcast. Or you want a specific topic or segment uh, interview, find that under the radio tab on the highlight tab on the right hand side of the main page. Until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs>